In this week's video, I'll be throwing and trimming two stoneware vases, two shapes I've already made a few of. But as any potter might know, it's often a good idea to overproduce, as you never really know how successful the pots will be once they've been finely glaze fired. In this instance, whilst I like both of these vases, I wanted to make a pair that were practically the same height, so they can be displayed together a bit more harmoniously. Both have trimmed feet and are coated in thick layers of felspathic crackle glazes, the colour of which, in this green one, is produced by just 2% red iron oxide added to the original recipe. Without it, it's this plain white colour that tends to sit on the form somewhat, as it lacks the flux the green does, which makes it break so nicely over the sharp rim and reveals the rich iron stoneware clay beneath. I'll be remaking both of these vases from about three pounds of clay, which is about 1,360 grams, give or take. For pieces like this, I don't mind if the weight is a little bit out, as ultimately, as I throw these pots, a fair amount of clay is gonna come off on my hands as slip, or it'll be scraped away from the base as I clean the vessel off before I remove it from the wheel. But first, and as always, these weighed out pieces of clay need to be thoroughly wedged. This process blends the clay together and removes any pesky air pockets, which can otherwise wreak havoc later when you're throwing the pot on the wheel. As when you discover them in the walls of your pot as you're pulling them up, you inevitably pop them, but this creates a thin spot in the wall, which creates an uneven area in thickness, which can cause all kinds of problems, like undulations in the rim, or, if it's bad enough, it can cause a twist in the spinning shape that ultimately leads the pot to buckle and collapse. This lump of clay is then thrown into the middle of the wheel and centered. This is a process I do with the wheel spinning very quickly and I use plenty of water so the mass of clay can be maneuvered without it sticking to my hands and being pulled off center. This is one of the hardest steps when it comes to learning how to throw pots, but I have made a video in my beginner's guide that's all about it, which I'll leave a link to on screen now and in the description below, and it breaks down the entire process in excruciating detail. Once the piece of clay is centered, I push my fingers down into the very middle and create the internal base, making sure there's enough material left in the very bottom to trim a nice foot from. It also doesn't want to be too thin, as otherwise you'll have no material to work with and you can be left with a rather scruffy foot or one with a hole in it. Both are correctable, but doing so will add considerable time to the making process. But perhaps that's a topic for another video in the future. The next step is to begin pulling up the walls of the pot. It's a rather complicated process to explain, and once again, my beginner's guide video goes into far more depth. But essentially, on the outside, I push in with my knuckle at the very base to create an indent. This pushes some of the excess clay up a little bit so it's usable. Then from the inside, just above the indentation at the base that I create, I push out with my fingertips to create a bulge of sorts. And then on the outside, I can use either my knuckle or in this case a sponge, to lift that bulge of clay upwards. With each consecutive pull, the walls get thinner and taller, and gradually I begin to roughly shape the pot I have in my mind's eye. Although clay does have limits, and if you pull it too quickly or too brashly, or you pull it so much that the walls become paper thin and then the whole vase comes tumbling down as the lower section of the wall can't support all the weight above it. You can also overthrow clay. This is when you pull the walls so much that the clay becomes super saturated with water and the material loses any strength it had and it'll feel, even though you're pulling the walls up, that you just aren't gaining any height as the soft walls just can't support themselves properly anymore. This is why, in some ways, it's beneficial to throw relatively quickly. Of course, this can change depending on the shape and size of pot you're making, but if it takes you 30 minutes to throw a single mug and you pull the walls up dozens and dozens of times, then there's a good chance those walls are going to be oversaturated and you'll have a much more difficult time removing that pot from the wheel once it's finished. And of course, I was there at some point. I think every potter is when they're first learning to throw on the wheel. So if overthrowing causes the pot to weaken and degrade, then if you throw it quickly and with less water, you'll find that the pieces just have a bit more strength to them. And it's this which helps me throw my mugs so finely and still be able to lift them off the wheel without them distorting, as the clay hasn't been overworked and it still retains a lot of its strength. 
with the rough shape of this vase now thrown, I can begin scraping away much of the excess slip from the outside and properly define the vessel's shape. From the inside, I'm pushing my fingers out against that metal edge on the outside, instead of just jamming the metal straight into the walls, which I do as this generally keeps the tools from snagging on the clay as the pressure being exerted is only on one small portion of the metal's edge on the outside, as opposed to the entirety of it. Yet when most of the slip has been removed, I will then use the entire edge of these metal tools, albeit with a much lighter touch. I then switch to a much sharper metal kidney, just to really straighten the shape out and to leave lovely slip-free surfaces. And this will ultimately mean that the pot is easier to remove from the wheel later on. If instead I left the pot covered in sticky slip, when I go to grasp my hands around it and lift it from the wheel, all that wet clay would mean I'd have no grip to lift the pot away and it would simply slip through my hands. Or, if I did manage to lift it away, when it comes to setting it aside on the wearboard, I won't be able to easily let go of the pot without those thin, sticky walls sticking to my hands as I remove them, which means there's a good chance the entire pot would be deformed as I remove my hands from the pot. And with that, I can set my throwing gauge so that the point comes close to the rim of the pot. This way I'll know how tall I need to throw the next piece. These gauges, by the way, are made by my friend Darren Ellis, and I'll leave a link to his website down below if you are interested. I then slide a twisted metal wire underneath the pot, and I make sure that my hands are scraped clean of any slip. I then gently clasp my hands around the pot and lift it away. following which the next vase can be thrown. And for this one, I'll speed through the footage, which not only gives you an idea of how much the clay is moved throughout this process, but also how much the light changes in my studio, which can be a nightmare when filming, as I need to constantly stand up and adjust my camera settings. And it's also why in some videos, my hands look particularly clean as I'm working, as I'm obviously having to wash my hands each time I touch the camera. The mirror you can see in front of me next to the throwing gauge allows me to see a perfect side view of the pot I'm making without having to lean awkwardly backwards. I can simply glance up to properly see the shape as my view from being perched slightly above the wheel can make it quite difficult to see the shape I'm working on. So if you haven't tried throwing with a mirror, I highly recommend it. A much better pair compared to the last. Similar, but very different. Masculine and feminine. And now, I'll leave these pots out overnight, partly covered in this slightly warm weather, so they don't dry out too much. I want them to be more or less completely leather hard from top to bottom for when I trim these. So first thing in the morning, I'll probably flip these pots over onto their rims, so the base and lower portion of the walls can dry out for a few hours too. They've shrunk a little bit at this point, that's what happens to pots as moisture leaves them, with the most notable difference occurring in the final glaze firing. At this stage though, the pots are still relatively wet, although I can now pick the pots up and move them around without the shape distorting. If you find that the trimmings that are carved away from the pot instantly stick back to the vessel itself, then the pot is still way too soft to be trimming. Likewise, if the exerted pressure of the tool being pushed into the clay is enough to really deform the pot by bowing the walls inward, then once again, the clay is too soft to be trimming. But that can also happen if you're trimming with turning tools that are far too blunt. The trimmers I'm using in this video are made from tungsten carbide. This means that they're incredibly sharp and they keep their edge for years, but this metal is also very brittle. And if one of these tools were to accidentally fall on the floor, they would shatter or chip. So I'm really careful about how I store them and even about how I place them down on my workbench as I definitely don't want them to roll off onto the floor. This wavering line is interesting as when the pot spins, it's very apparent that it's uneven. Yet when stationary, you simply don't notice it. So in cases where there's enough material to properly correct it, 
I will. But in this case, as that portion of the wall was beginning to feel relatively thin, I'd rather not push my luck. And there's still a chance I can make it better by using a scraper above and below that line, but let's see. Occasionally too, the pot will dislodge as I'm trimming. And this is typically why I keep my left hand on the pot at all times, just so it's ready to catch the piece if it does do this. If this does happen and nothing actually goes wrong, I simply attach it back onto the wheel and continue trimming. Before I trim the base of the pot, I just want to correct the rim slightly. I want to thin it out so it comes to a beveled point on the outside of the lip, which gives the appearance that the whole pot is much lighter and thinner than it really is. If instead I trimmed it so it had a blocky, thick top, you might perceive the pot differently and think it's a heavier vessel than it necessarily is. I compress the rim with a rubber kidney just to make the clay here nice and smooth, as opposed to being slightly gritty and rough, which this clay body can be when it's freshly turned, as it contains quite a lot of grog, which is revealed as I trim over the surface. With the walls and rim trimmed, I separate the pot from the wheel by sliding a metal knife underneath it. I then scrape away any excess left on the metal and try my best to make sure there's no bits of clay that'll stick into the rim as I place the pot upside down back onto the wheel. The vase is then secured in place with three pieces of soft clay and place a nylon spinner on top of the pot through which I can apply quite considerable downward pressure. It can then be removed and the actual base trimmed. Yet, as I work, I'm still applying downward pressure, be it through my fingertips or through the tool itself. As without doing this, and as I'm trimming on a piece that's quite high up and relatively unstable, the vase would likely topple to one side. As I trim, I check the thickness of the base by pressing down lightly with my thumb. If I feel the floor of the pot move, then I know it's thin enough and I need to stop trimming, but, with these two vases, I purposefully left enough material in the bottom so that I can trim a deep foot, as this time I'd quite like to glaze the inside of the feet, which is something I didn't do with the previous two. My movements at this stage are all very precise and careful, as with one slip I could easily gouge through the outer extremity of the foot, or pierce a hole in the base, or trim in such a way that the vase dislodges and pulls off center. So I brace both my hands to add stability and I tuck my elbows into my torso, which helps to keep my arms and hands steady. Once trimmed, I burnish these surfaces as these two planes around the base, so the clay here is lovely and smooth. And then finally, I stamp the pot with my maker's mark, rocking it from corner to corner so it leaves a clear impression. And that's one vase trimmed. Now it's time for the next. And once again, I'll speed through this process, which I always find fascinating to do at the trimming stage, as it demonstrates nicely just how much a pot can change during the trimming process. Although just like the other, this vase also dislodged halfway through being turned. And this foot was even trickier to trim as the piece is rather top heavy here, and it felt like at any moment it would fall to one side, if I made just one single mistake. And here are the two finished pots, for now at least. I'll now leave these out, exposed to the air, to slowly turn bone dry. Then they'll be bisque fired to 1000 degrees Celsius, glazed, and then fired again to 1290 degrees Celsius, which means there's still a lot more work to be done. Thank you, as always, for taking your precious time to watch, and I'll see you next week.